Good morning. Welcome. Uh, if you are uh, just arriving, uh, you uh, missed a great first service. We had uh, a fantastic um, uh, opportunity to gather together with our guests today uh, who are uh, standing here. If you have not experienced, uh, well, first of all, raise your hand if you've experienced Dave and or Joe before. So there's a few folks in the room. You're not entirely unfamiliar to this crowd, but uh, the church um, has been blessed for uh, a number of years by the ministry of these two uh, gentlemen and uh, using the gifts that God has given them to help uh, communities of faith like ours and collections of people all over the country hear something uh, different and fresh and, uh, and uh, we are blessed and they have uh, graciously offered to spend some time with us as a community this morning between services uh, exploring some of the key themes that drive them in their ministry um, and so that's all I really want to say and, and but uh, let's give them a nice round of applause to welcome them Great to meet you. This, this, whew, all right, there we go. There we go. We're about to get started here. We are going to take this first step on the justice journey. Who should take the first step, Dave? Should, should you take it or should I take the first step? Mm, well, Joe, as I think about it, I think about your, you know, ancestors, historically what you've been through mm -hmm. and, you know, kind of been sometimes held back and I feel like mm. if you could you know maybe get out ahead I think you should probably take the first step. That, that's a good point I appreciate you saying that that is a good point okay maybe I'll take the first step on this justice journey here we go but wait 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 I, I don't know if I should take the first step because you know a lot of times my ancestors the people who look like me are forced to take the first step even if they don't want to take it maybe you should take the first step because then then like people who look like you will get inspired and then they'll also want to take the first step yeah 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 there you go you should yeah yeah but, you know, I've also seen how this works, you know, yeah. when, when people that look like me take the mm -hmm. first step, yeah. Yeah. even if it's like a teeny little step, they're like, wow, look at that guy. Let's build monuments yeah. after this. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> That's going to take oh, the work of the people that have been doing it a lot longer. I don't want that. Mm, okay, okay. I hear, I hear you. Okay, here we go. Here we go. Wait, 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 wait. I don't think I should take the first step. Because, you know, if, if I'm always taking the first step, then maybe you'll never learn how to take the first step yourself. You got to learn how to do it. So, so you got this. Go ahead, take the first step. I really want to do it. I promise. Yeah, you got this. Go ahead. Go ahead. I just need to, you know, figure it out so I can do it perfectly. You know, I want to read some perfect. Books, do some workshops. You know, give me five, six, seven years. I promise. Years? Wait, we, we don't even have that much time. Like, come on, man. You're, you're talking so much. You get stuck in your head. You're overthinking. You just, you just gotta do it. You gotta just move. I, I, I'll do it. But could you just? I got one more idea that I think could be helpful. Could you just like, sign a permission slip that says like I'm a good guy. I would never hurt anyone on purpose. On the off chance. A permission slip. <laughs> Come on, man. You don't need all of that, man. Come on, you, you can do this. You got this. Just, just go. Just move. It looks way too hard. I, I don't think I can do this on my own. Honestly, I don't think I can. <sighs> you know what? If I'm being honest, I don't think I can do it by myself either. Wait, what about this? What if we take the first step together? Should we take the first step together? Yeah? yeah? Try. All right, all right let's, let's give it a shot. Let's give it a shot. Here we go. All right, here we go. One, two, three. Oh, oh you did it. We're, yeah, you're still alive. We made it. Oh, yeah. Oh, Woo. so good to get over my paralysis and just... Oh, man, it really does. But hey, hey don't, don't get too excited. Remember, we still got a long way to go. It's a marathon, not a sprint. So let's get it. Here we go. All right. One, two, three. Hey. Yeah! Hey. Hey. I didn't die or anything. I'm still here. This is Woo. great. We got this. We got this. But remember, God's got us. And, and if, if you slip up, I got your back. If I slip up, you got my back. We got the ancestors. We got community. Let's do this. We got what it takes. Let's go again. We're going to count with us. One, two, three. Oh, uh, yeah. Should we keep going? Let's keep keep going. Hey, uh, 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 uh. Thank Who's ready to go on the justice journey with us? Make some noise. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Right on, right on. We don't walk alone. We don't walk alone. Yeah, we're going to keep working on this mic. But in the meantime, uh, click, please. We have Erica the Clicker. Give it up for Erica. Our Shout out to Erica. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Got real MVP. So if we asked you all as a group, we said, what is culture? There might be, I don't know, 43 different answers in this room. I say culture, you say what? What, what comes to mind or how might you define it or what, what phrases might come to mind? Just popcorn, popcorn style. 
Assumptions. Assumptions. Traditions. Language. 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 Conventions. Values. Values. This is smart. This is smart. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Art. 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 Yeah. Oh. Actions. Action. Music. Clothing. Food. Clothing. Clothing. All the things. Clean. Yes. Please. Yes. <laughs> so everything you said is right. That's in included in this definition. So there's a big textbook definition up here. It says culture can be defined as the sum of way of life, including expected behavior, beliefs, values, language, and living practices. Shared by members of society, it consists of both explicit and implicit the rules through which experience is interpreted. That's the Global Perspective Project. But Dave and I have a definition of culture that we like to use. It's much simpler and we feel more accessible. We like to say culture is people who have figured out how to do life together. So everything you said is included in how we have figured out how to do life together. That includes our food, our values, our clothes, all the things you all name, that's how we have figured out how to do life together. And there's different cultures in different places, right? You have a family culture. You have a school culture, you have a church culture, right? Generational culture. These are all different areas and where we where we have figured out how to do life together. That's what we want to talk about today. And it would be really easy if every time you join a church, every time you join a family, every time that you join any uh, organization, they said, hey, here's our manual, and this teaches you every single thing you ever need to know about how we do conflict, how we do decision making, how we do time, how we, but guess what? You don't get that, right? You know why? Because no, of it's learned, it's shared, and it's usually unspoken, right? You, you kind of pay attention. You look at the rules of the road. You're like, oh, that's how we, oh, when, the, when Pastor Chris says 10, 10 a.m., that might mean 10.05, or that means if you're not early or late, you better be here at 10, or they're going to look at you funny when you walk in. That's all being negotiated under the iceberg, right? Um, and so culture shapes everything. It shapes, uh, Clay, sorry. Um, you're doing great. Culture shapes something as simple as a handshake and a greeting. When I, when I grew up, I was always taught, um, if, if somebody can't look you in the eye and give you a firm handshake, you should definitely not hire them for, your, for a job, and you definitely don't let them date your child. Never. Don't do that. Um, and then I, you know, through my travels and through other you know, friends of mine, I discovered that's actually not a universal thing. When um, those of you who have maybe traveled into East Asia, Oftentimes, the more the lighter the handshake, the more deferential and respectful you're being to the person. Or in some indigenous cultures or other cultures, um, with eye contact is really rude, actually, to just look somebody in the eye like that that you don't know very well. So even things that we think are just universal, uh, turns out um, it, culture is informing all of it. It, it. it even informs what we see and what we don't see, our mind's eye. So for example, on this next one, depending on your cultural pickling, as my friend likes to say, uh, if you look at this picture, those of you who come from a more individualistic culture would look at the foreground to the one or two people there in the front. Those who come from a collectivist culture, their minds, I would immediately be trained to look at the community of people. And I discovered this when I was at Luther Seminary down the road. We were reading this uh, story of uh, the prodigal son. You may have heard of it. And, uh, and I'm, I'm talking to my Kenyan classmate and I'm saying, this is such a great story about this individual who, you know, hurt another individual and that individual forgave him. Because that's all the Western renderings that I had ever seen in this story was a picture of two people in the story, right? It's the dad, the son. I'm sorry, dad. Okay, I forgive you. That's the way I was telling it. He said, we don't see it at all like that in my community. We see it as a community had failed to care for this child. And it was, it, he was being restored back into the community. So if you see any of the non-Western renderings of this story, you'll see a whole village that's partying together. Like, yay, he's back and our family's been restored. So, uh, so even the way we read scripture can be uh, informed by our cultural lenses that we wear. And it shapes a lot, right, Joe? It does. Next slide, please. So this is an image right, that Dave right, was talking right, about. That's that communal celebration of the prodigal son return to his community. So not just the healing of the individual, but the healing of the community. That's a cultural lens, right? And so we can go to the next slide. So, so we all have ways that, that we're informed by our culture. Oftentimes, when we think about the ways that culture informs us, we think about, you know, food, clothes, music. If we want to celebrate culture, we're going to have like a potluck where everyone brings different food. And that's part of culture. It's a beautiful way to celebrate culture, but that is only the tip of the iceberg, right? Those things that I named are on the tip, but beneath the waterline, there's a depth 
a rich, textured, nuanced, complex layers of culture that we don't always see. It's easy to see that stuff above the surface. We know about that stuff, but all the time, every experience we have is a cultural experience, and there's lots going on beneath the surface we may not even be aware of. Like, we talked about time, that's a big one, how people navigate time. I love to talk about that, because there's like these big words for it. There's, there's monochronic and polychronic. So monochronic means one way of looking at time that's more task-based, saying, hey, we're gonna start right on the dot at this time. That means when you're, if you're not early, you're late. And then there's polychronic, poly meaning many, and that's like, oh, it's more relation, relational. So like, maybe you talk to a friend along the way and things get started a little bit later than we said it was gonna get started, and that's a cultural understanding. But where we get in trouble is, is when we think there's only one right way to do things, right? And that's what happens with culture sometimes, is we think that our culture is always the right culture and the only culture, when really, there's so many different ways. Look at this list, this isn't even a complete, the definitive, comprehensive list, there's still more ways that we do things, how we raise our kids, right? Um, the the uh, social interactions, we talk about like proximity, how close we are, body language, all these things are culturally informed. So we wanna kind of peel back some of those layers, and go a little bit deeper in our, in our session today. Yeah, click please. So this intercultural competence, and we, we, we don't really, I try not to use this word anymore. Uh, competence sounds like, oh, I got this completely figured out and I've mastered it. Uh, I, I talk about it as development or humility anyway, but it's this ability to, to be able to shift our perspective and to uh, adapt our behavior to cultural commonality and to difference. So if we overemphasize commonality, we will end up in conformity. We don't want to do that. But if we overemphasize uh, difference, we'll end up in fragmentation and we don't necessarily want to do that either. So we're trying to place a proper emphasis on both similarity and on difference. People are always saying to me like, well, are, I mean, I grew up in New Ulm, Minnesota, and we were a proud German town. And are you telling me that this, you know, similarity we had in my town and this, you know, beautiful culture that we had developed together is a is a horrible thing? Like, no, that's a beautiful thing. That's great to have a rich culture to celebrate that culture. But like Joe said earlier, it's when you think that's the only thing, or you don't even see the the contours of difference that are happening that are present even in a quote unquote mon monocultural space, right? We'll get into that a little bit more, but that's that's part of the challenges. How do I see the difference within the difference that that's present? The microcultural and macrocultural differences. Next, yeah, and so there, there's lots and lots and lots of dimensions to culture. We're always looking through these lenses, whether we realize it or not. These are what we call cultural diversity dimensions. And so Dave and I talk about, you know, um, we 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 got this from uh, who was the name of the guy who talked about the window. Oh, looking that, through the window. Uh, Jer uh, Jeremiah Wright. Jeremiah Wright, yeah, but we would talk about like looking through the window. If you say, look through this window, what do you see? And most people would say, oh, you know, I see the trees out there. But then we don't always think about the, the window in and of itself, the glass, right? The lens that we see through. And that's what we're referring to when we say the, the cultural diversity dimensions. These are the lenses that we see through that shape all of our experiences. And again, this isn't a definitive list. That's why we put other in the corner. But these are, these are the lenses that shape our experiences when we walk in different rooms, most of the rooms. And when there's usually one, there's usually a few uh, that shape our, our experiences more than others. So we wanna invite you all to kind of think about that. What are the top ones? If you were to pick three that, that shape your experience the most, which three would those be? Can you give wanna... an example of one for you and why? Yeah, yeah, so for instance, I would say uh, abilities and disabilities is something that really shapes my experience, right? Uh, when I when I go through life, I I can just go up the stairs, or I can I can like walk most places. I don't have to worry about oh, is there a ramp uh, that's like wheelchair accessible if I was in a chair, or um, and I I can hear well. Like I don't always need microphones or things like that, but maybe I have some friends who are like uh, I just can't hear you unless you have a microphone, right? And so these are things that have to do with abilities and disabilities. Um, and that's, that's one that I would name shapes my life, shapes my experience. And there's others, are there some for you as well? Yeah, I think for me, like, uh, this is just the one that came to mind because it's the first one. Family background, you know, I grew up a child of divorce. Uh, and so when I'm crafting a message, for example, when a church says, hey, come talk to us, um, I don't usually say dumb things about divorced people because <laughs> I know how that feels, right? I'm very sensitive to that. So I, I wouldn't say like, oh, you know, divorced people are this or divorced people are that. I wouldn't even assume what a family looks like because I have a family that looks very different than, you know, inside the nine dots family. 
Um, and so I think that's another, maybe that's an informal way to talk about it, but it's like, what's the thing you're least likely to say, you know, dumb things about? <laughs> if, if you were to preach a sermon, you know, uh, I, I as a man, for example, um, if I'm trying to exegete, you know, a woman at the well, there's going to be some things that I think I'm probably going to miss about that experience because I don't have the experience of being female body. And um, so anyway, so, so when you think about that, what are the three that might be uh, the most salient for you that come to mind? Is everybody kind of tracking where we're going with this? I mean, yeah. give it a best shot. Okay. If you can think, think for yourself, we'll give you a second to think about which would be your top three. And then we're going to do a sound wave to get a sense of in the room, which are the top three diversity dimensions that, that you're choosing for yourselves? I always say you're an expert of your own experience. Like there's no right or wrong answer. We're not gonna be like, Arr, you got it wrong. No, it's, it's whatever you think, whatever you feel, that's, that's how you're connecting to your diversity dimensions. So you think you got it? So we'll say, uh, if you chose family background, please say I. If you chose gender identity, please say I. If you chose age, please say I. If you chose abilities or disabilities, please say I. If you chose education, please say I. If you chose language, please say I. If you chose socioeconomic status slash class, please say I. Thank you. If you chose nationality, please say I. I. If you chose sexual orientation, please say I. If you chose work experience, please say aye. aye. If you chose religion, please say aye. Aye. Ethnicity, please say aye. Hometown roots, please say aye. Race, aye. Other, aye. Thank you. Joe, is that a six hour workshop just to unpack these? Results? It could be, but don't worry, we're not gonna <laughs> take that work six hour workshop. But we do want you to continue to think about this and unpack this a little bit more. Yeah. Do we have time to just get one smart person to talk about what they deduced from our results? I think so. Okay. Yeah. If that might... one smart person doesn't talk for six hours. <laughs> no, you might have to do <laughs> Oprah because I don't, I don't have a wireless oh, mic. Yeah. So. Okay. yeah. Anybody want to share uh, maybe why they chose what they chose or maybe what they noticed in the room by everyone's responses? Yeah, right over here. I'm coming to you. <laughs> Thank you. I chose education and language. I'm a teacher. And I also have an ABE ELL licensure, so I teach um, English to refugees and immigrants. So those are things that I'm always um, thinking about. What's your name? Barb Berger. Barb, thank you so much, Barb. We, we have, we have a, a, one of our cultural practices whenever we're holding a community together, whenever anyone shares, we say, beloved child of God, you matter. So say that to Barb together. Barb, Barb beloved, beloved child, child of God, of God you, you matter. matter. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. So let's, right Joe, on. let's think about the one that maybe is not on our radar, right? She mentioned, yeah. I work with these kids every day, so I'm thinking about thinking it all about the time. It. Yep, but yep. there's probably ones that you haven't thought about in the last three weeks, right? Yep. Or maybe a month. So should we, should we reflect on that for a minute? Yeah, think about the ones that you don't think about. <laughs> Where, where's, where's something on this list you're like, oh yeah, I never, I didn't even think that was a thing, or I, I forgot that that's, that's something that, that exists, right? There's probably at least one, if not more, on this list that never really crosses your mind. It's just not on your radar. Think about those for a moment. So Joe, one, one of them for me that I've just started to try to get more in touch with is uh, with my beloved. Um, you know, I, I like hugged her in public recently or showed some kind of affection and I and I and I remember going, oh my gosh, like I never had a thought of like, gee, I hope it's okay if I hug her. And what if somebody sees and then not and they're not okay and then I'm not physically and emotionally safe to do this. I didn't think about that at all. I'm just like, I'm gonna hug you, I'm gonna kiss you, nobody's gonna have a problem with it, right? If I uh, were LGBTQ plus, if 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 it was a same gender relationship, if there was some other um, configuration of our relationship. I might have more anxiety, right? So that, that's, that's, a, that's where yeah. I'm trying to note, or when I talk about her to others, right? She's a her, so I don't have any anxiety about, oh yeah, mm -hmm. my beloved, she's great, I love her. I never think about, oh my gosh, is this the time to you know, come out in this moment and tell somebody that I'm with somebody of the same gender, or, you know, that yeah, kind of thing. You don't have to worry about safe space and those exactly. sorts of things. Exactly. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think for me too, uh, language. Language is one that I don't always think about because I'm, I'm an English speaker in a, in a predominantly English speaking culture. But then I go to other, other spaces, like we've been working with a bilingual church recently, been doing like a long-term residency and we go there every time. And I love how they're, they're super intentional about making sure everything's written in English and in Spanish. And, and they do their sermons and they have ways that both English and Spanish speakers can engage and they interpret everything. I'm like, this is really cool. I love the way they're building this culture, but that's not what I'm always thinking about. I only know a little bit of like, hablo solamente un poquito español, solamente un poquito, but not very much. I don't really think about it. And so language is something that I'm coming back to again. I'm, I'm tapping back into that Duolingo, trying to sharpen my skills, but it's an important thing to, to think about that. Yeah. Did you have a question or a thought? Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Your story just reminded me of something that I try to take into account now, and it's not up there on the list, but it's life experience of trauma. Yeah. Because you talked about hugging somebody in public. There are gestures which just trigger people who have had trauma in life. And so one of the things I've learned to do, my wife is a therapist that works with a lot of trauma, and she's had trauma in her past. Mm -hmm. And it's taught me a lot about that. So I kind of try to feel people out as to where they're at, because things that are perfectly appropriate, like touching, hugging, even a friendly gesture, might be might trigger something. Absolutely. That's great. Hey, Ken, is it Michael? Michael. Michael, beloved Michael. child of God, you matter. That's one of the things Dave and I are really intentional about is, is uh, practicing consent as part of a cultural practice. Like before you even shake somebody's hand or a hug or high five, you wanna ask if they're okay with that because that means different things to different people given their lived experience. Yeah, absolutely. And so, and so <laughs> what, what Peter or others might, might do from the front is they might just say something like, hey, um, we're gonna pass the peace now. And um, we, we acknowledge that there's a lot of different levels of comfort with touch and everything. So we just keep that in mind as you're going about the congregation. Um, that's we call that a micro inclusion right if we could do microaggressions towards each other we can also do micro inclusions and that is being able to say beloved child of god you matter by adapting our behavior to make somebody else feel more welcome and included that's really the goal of what we're going for now. yep and that's how we take this this into practice right as you continue to think about what are the ones that aren't on my list that aren't even on my radar because there's someone who has that identity right I, I promise you there's someone who has that identity whether you're aware of it or not and the, the practice is deepening your awareness of those people around you so we can adapt our, our behavior and we can really have that beloved community where everyone has a, has a sense of connection and belonging. And so it's fun to kind of lay these out as if they're all weighted equally, but we know they're not actually, right? We know that um, some of these carry real uh, existential threat uh, and others maybe less. Uh, and so we call that right-handed and left-handed identities. These ideas, this idea that um, there are uh, different, for example, I, my guess is it was probably mostly right-handed people who built this church. And my guess is when you, when you go to sit at a desk in Sunday school, it's probably made for a right-handed person. That's my guess. My guess is when you go to use a can opener in this kitchen, it's gonna be made for right-handed people. That's my guess. Well, that's an analogy for all of these identities. My guess is that there were people of a certain uh, religious tradition who built this church. That's my guess. Um, they may be, right? <laughs> They're laughing because yeah, okay. it's true, right? <laughs> um, yeah. My guess is there are people um, who, as they were creating the bylaws of this church, had a certain educational level. They had a certain racial ethnic identity. They had a certain, um, you know, and so on and so forth. Does that make sense? And so if you come in with a different identity, you're like, oh. I feel this is like I'm. It, it, it's the equivalent of I'm the left-handed person getting elbowed at the dinner table all the time because they didn't think about me when they were creating this dinner table, right? Um, so we want to make sure that we're able to arrange the table so that and, and help pe and people help us arrange the table so that all can feel welcome as opposed to this preset table that is immovable. Uh, but hey, you bring your ingredients, we'll bring our ingredients together because it's really God's table anyway. Amen. Amen. We're trying to create an ambidextrous world. Right. And so that's that's the difference between saying all are welcome yes. and we created this with you in mind. Right. There's a distinction between yes. that. And so that's what we're working towards. Because We have this is the way that society is looking nowadays. Right. We didn't come up with this. Someone else came up with this. And this is the, the, the world that we're born into. But the closer that people are to that center of power, that's that's the more uh, power and privilege that they have. So I, I don't know if you can read everything on here. It may be hard to read if you're a little bit farther back. Um, but 
what it says here is it's, it's a wheel of power and privilege. And so for instance, it'll say like white is closest to the power and then it goes different shades. And then the farther you go out into darker skin, then it's more marginalized, right? And the same can go with citizenship for another example. Uh, those who have citizen status, those who are documented and the farther out the undocumented um, and so on and so forth. And these are people who are closest in proximity to, to advantages and power and privileges. But we want to change that, right? We want everybody to be able to have um, you know, equal treatment or uh, what we talk, talk about is equity. Yeah, so, so if you look right in the center, I'm very close to that bullseye right there in the body I live in. And so I, I grew up telling a tale to myself, and it's a good story, and it's partially true, about a young man who grew up with you know, a single mom in the inner city and through the sweat of his brow was able to create a successful musical career for himself. And, um, and it's a great, I mean, I, I worked hard and I, I, it, it doesn't mean that I didn't work hard, but a friend of mine came up to me and she said, Dave, you've, you've been able to make a living in this church doing music. And, 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 and she said, do you know part of why you've been able to do that? And I said, no. And she said, well, when you enter a space with the body that you live in, you're able to be as comfortable as you want to be in almost every space, especially in a 98% white ELCA church. Um, you, you, you can be as comfortable as you want to be. And the reason why you're able to be so comfortable is because female identifying folks, LGBTQ plus folks, uh, people of color are shouldering the discomfort so that you can be as comfortable as you want to be. And, and, and I was like, oh, wow, that, I did not think about that. And, and, and she was saying, and when you take up a bunch of space, sometimes peop, those people are asked to shrink themselves. In other words, you're like, you're like in this house, right? And you got this, and, and you're with Jesus, and you're feeling so comfortable, and it's feeling good. But there is a, a paralyzed man who's outside the house who's trying to get in, and you're not seeing him because you're so in, you're an insider. And, and so, um, so what are you going to do about that? And every time you feel really, really comfortable, the first question should be, I wonder who's uncomfortable in this space right now. If I'm really comfortable in the lunchroom or at work or in the narthex, I wonder who's uncomfortable right now. And you know what? Let's just cut a hole in that roof and let them. <laughs> That's what they did. That's in the scripture, in the story. Yeah. They, cut, they cut a hole in the roof and the, the friends of the man who was paralyzed, they cut a hole in the roof and they lowered him in so he can be closer to Jesus. And that's one way that you can Move up, take, take space, space, right? That's, that's part of this power dance we talk about. And there's times where I've experienced that too. Next. Where, oh yeah, we can go to the next slide. Yeah, yeah, you have a question? We have a question here. Yeah. Can you explain neurodiversity? Good question. Yeah, yeah, I would say, so, so Dave and I both have neurodiversity and it manifests in many different ways. So as we talk about uh, uh, dominant culture, right? There's, there's like a dominant way at least that's perceived. I really think that neurodiversity is, is a really interesting one because I think there's far more neurodiverse people than we even realize. But there's, there's a, a, a way that people perceive that the brain is to work, perceive our brains to work, like a dominant cultural pattern that your brain works. But if you have ADHD or ADD or a myriad of other uh, what's called neurodivergence or the, as the kids say nowadays, neurospicy <laughs> ways of thinking, then that would be falling on that, that umbrella. Um, Autism. Autism, exactly. Yeah, yep, that's one of them as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so Dave and I both have, I mean, I don't want to tell your story or anything, but yeah, yeah. yeah. Right, yeah, ADD. I, I, I haven't been diagnosed, but I'm confident that I, I, I just like to say I have a multi-dimensional mind. You know what I'm saying? It contributes to my creativity. But yeah, that's part of, part of the neurodivergent experience. So yeah, thank you for asking. It's a great question. So, so yeah, even those of us who are neurodivergent or who have those experiences where we're being marginalized, like I can think about times uh, where I come into this space and I may be the only person who looks like me. It happens quite a lot in this Lutheran world. And um, you know, those are spaces where sometimes it's expected where, oh, you know, I'm just gonna tuck in the back. I'm not gonna say or do much. But I'm like, no, I'm all of who God called and created me to be. That's what I'm gonna move up, take space, and invite other people to do the same. And then there's also times where I am actually centered, but like I've been to meetings as a man where there's been like women there and the men are just sucking up all the oxygen, we're just taking up all the space, not even letting the women get any words in edgewise. 
I could be like, <clears throat> excuse me, my, my fellow brethren, uh, you need to make some more space for the women and, and the non-male voices that are in the room. That could be a practice, right, to carry forward. And that's when I can move back, make space. Right? And it's a dance. It's a dance. There's times we got to take up space or we got to uh, make space for others as well. And sometimes it's helpful to feel it in your body. So we're going to do this. We're going to have, have you unleash that inner dancer that's been buried deeply inside of some of you. So please rise as you're able. We're just going to practice it real quick. So as you're able, you might not be able to slide too much here, but we're going to move up. And so, so imagine the scenario. Imagine the scenario. You are someone who is marginalized or minoritized or oftentimes kind of pushed to the back or overlooked. And you're really uncomfortable a lot of times. All right, I got, when, I got one for you. All right, well, what do we do in that scenario? Right, Pastor Peter, he keeps using these Game of Thrones references in his sermons. <laughs> and I am 85 years old, and I don't feel like he's ever speaking my language. Not speaking to your generation, so your so cultural I generation. After the sermon, I say, Pastor Peter, can we get some kind of references that speak to us? Like, hmm. use something every once in a while that, that, you know, that speaks to the older generation. Way to advocate for yourself. I advocate for yeah. myself, so I gotta move up, take, take space. space. Do that with us, try that with us. Great. We're gonna move up, take, take space. space. Sorry, there we go. Pastor Peter, how was this kid? <laughs> we're just, we're just kidding. I love so, you. <laughs> See, I knew it. I knew it. There we go. All right, what about I, I got one. I got one. So got this one. is a true to life experience. So I, when I was when I was younger, I had a friend who came to me in confidence, like, "Hey, Joe, you know, I don't tell a lot of people this, but you know, I grew up both male and female organs, and I'm intersex." So I was like, "Whoa, I never heard of intersex before. I don't know what what that is, but I still love you. I'm gonna walk with you, and I don't know much about it, so I'm gonna humble myself. I'm gonna listen. I'm gonna learn. And that's what I'm gonna move back and make space." Let's try that. Move, move back, back and make space. Let's see if they're getting the concept. Let's see if one or two more people have an example of moving up, taking space, or moving back, making space. And we'll do the dance together. Anybody? Times when you, you gave space to another person, or times when you had to advocate for yourself and, and take up more space with, with other people? Advocating for others for yourself. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yes, yes, yes. What's your name, friend? Roy. Roy, Roy. Beloved child of God, uh, you, you matter. matter. Yeah, yeah. I don't think we said it to our Wait, friend over here. Actually, oh. we for, I don't want to forget. Yeah, you had a Bill. comment earlier. Bill? Yeah. Dan, Sorry, Dan, Dan, beloved child of God, uh, you matter. Because you said you talked earlier. Yeah, yeah. Should we do it with Roy? Yeah. Move up, take space. So that can even be those with, you know, dominant cultural identities, of which I have a lot. Sometimes, see, I, when I first learned this dance, and, and my friend explained it to me, I said, oh, so I'm always supposed to show up and shut up. And, and, and so there I am, I'm in this meeting, true story, there's a black woman who's experiencing a microaggression. People, people are uh, saying things to her that are micro insults, invalidations, they're not micro, they're, they're micro in intention, macro in impact. And I'm watching this, because I'm like, remember, you weren't supposed to say anything, you're supposed to sit there, you're supposed to not, not take up any space. And she's like, actually, I needed you to disrupt what was happening there. I needed you to use your power to move up and take make space, space in that moment, right? So that we could say, hey, wait a minute, this isn't cool. So it's a, like you said, it's a dance. It really, it's really, and you may not always get it right. That's the thing about dancing is sometimes you stumble, you step on people's toes, and you mess up. It can be awkward and uncomfortable. But the beautiful thing is God gives us grace, right? Grace and mercy renews every morning, as Dave says, like every conversation every chance we get to keep practicing this dance together so yeah sure, we have, they can sit down now. yeah you may be seated you may be seated but keep practicing the dance though keep exactly. practicing exactly. even outside of this you can drive in you can move up next. take space <laughs> next yeah. and next one more yes yes so a lot of what we're talking about like when dave mentioned those those microaggressions right things that are said or done that cause another person harm that's interpersonal right uh that's only one leg in this three-legged stool of systemic oppression. So, so oftentimes when we have these conversations, we don't always address all three legs, but we're really intentional to name that there's, there's three legs to this stool. So interpersonal, that's only one of them, right? And then there's actually two others as well. There's the structural, which has to do with uh, well, what happens in our organizations, right? The structure of our organizations, the practices, the, the protocols, the procedures, those sorts of things, like the or Robert's rules, and like you know those sorts of media, and then there's system, and then there's uh, stories, and stories is more cultural, 
what are the stories that we carry with us? Like maybe it's the artwork, like in the stained glass windows or, or flags or symbols. It's all symbolic statues, those sorts of things. And I think I saw a hand back here. Yeah. Yeah, can you read us the whatever's on the red and the blue? Because those are invisible to me. Oh, yes. Thank you for asking. Hey, he just moved up. Uh, take, take space. space. Way to advocate. Yeah, yeah. 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 Thank you for letting us know. Yeah. To break it down. Yeah. So, um, so just to break it down. Um, so, so the red says cell structure stories, and the blue says uh, kindness, justice, and and so I have a friend named Bill Bixby, and he talks about the humble work, humble walk of a servant in Micah six eight, and and he says, you know, kindness. Well, what does the Lord require of us but to do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with our God? Justice, kindness, and so when Joe and I go to churches. And, and, and they say, yeah, you know, we're, um, we're really, like, anti-racist in this church. Or we're really, um, you know, doing so much good work for the community. And we always say, oh, tell us more. Um, and they say, uh, we, did, we, we feed people. Like, cool, kindness. What else do you do? Uh, we're really nice to black people when they walk in our sanctuary. Cool, kindness. What else? Um, well, you know, and, and usually most of what they're doing is kindness, kindness, kindness. It's like one foot kindness. kindness yeah, kindness. yeah, yeah. <laughs> We're waiting for, but what about justice? When Dr. King says that we, we, we bandage the wound of those who've been wounded on the road, right? Um, but then we bandage enough wounds, we start asking questions about the road. Why are so many people being harmed on this road? Let's change the road. Let's think about the road. And when you think about the road, especially as a church, sometimes you get accused of being political. When I dun, wanted, dun, dun. Dun, dun, dun. When I wanted to feed people, <laughs> they called me a saint. And when I asked why they were hungry, they called me a communist, says a Latin American priest. So that's something to really watch for, right, is when we start asking questions about systems and structures. Now, wait, wait a minute. Ho, ho, ho. Slow, slow down there, buddy. Yeah, yeah. How come huh. that in some communities, for example, um, in many um, Spanish-speaking Spanish Latine, commu Latine communities, um, they, some of them are very culturally Catholic. So if they were to, let's just say, come to a Lutheran church and they would want to join your church, well, but they don't actually ever want to be members because in some families they'll actually get disowned <laughs> if, they, if they ever become a Lutheran. But they are here, they worship, they're a part of the community, but in our constitution, it says, if you're not a member, you don't get much power in this church. That's just what the Constitution says. So that would be an example of a structural uh, oppression that people experience. Does that make sense? The structural one, I think, is the hardest one sometimes to get our minds wrapped around. I don't know. Anything else you want to say about all that? Yeah, but th this is all interconnected, right? A lot of times, these will even overlap, and it might be hard to kind of parcel out, like, which is which. Uh, there could be some overlap with some of them, but I think that the key here is to recognize that it's all interconnected. And, and, and we take what we call a healing justice approach. So healing justice means that you can't have healing without justice. You can have justice without healing. If we heal our bodies from like the wounds inflicted on us by trauma, um, we'll have healed bodies, but then we'll have unjust systems and laws that need to change. But if we change all the laws and everything's just, then we still got to heal our bodies, right? So you need both. And we're working, we're working on both at the same time. And it's not like it's going to magically just change and happen overnight. Um, it takes a lot of work. And there have been changes over the years uh, thanks to movements of people right, coming together and working to create that preferred and promised future, that beloved community that we read about in Scripture. So, Yeah, and so I think for many of us, we, uh, we have kind of inherited this, what we call an implicit curriculum. Right, we have explicit curriculum and education theory. There's ex explicit curriculum, implicit curriculum, and then like a missing curriculum. So things that are caught, things that are taught, things that are not present, right? In my family, I was always taught that um, race does not matter. Uh, we, we see, we love all of God's beloved children. Um, you know, we don't even notice race. Like if you were to talk about Joyce, yeah, Joyce is just Joyce. I don't notice that she has darker skin, right? That was the way I was explicitly taught. Implicitly, when I looked at around me, I was like, my life is completely segregated. So clearly race does matter. Wait, what do you mean? What do you mean that um, we've never had a black person even set foot in the house for dinner? So I thought we didn't notice, wait, wait a minute. So that, that's, the, that's what was missing from the curriculum. Does that make sense? So we've all inherited this curriculum around race, around gender, around a lot of things. And what Joe and I really want to 
help people do, especially those with dominant cultural identities like myself, is to understand our own story of race. Because um, I didn't grow up thinking I had a story of race. Race is something that other people have, right? Race is these people over here. Out there. But it's actually right here the whole time. Preach. Yeah. And, and so we want to invite uh, you all into what we call a racial biography. So we encourage you all to do this yourselves as well. But what Dave and I have done is we've traced our stories of race from throughout our entire lives, where from the time we could first remember our first encounters of race and what different instances, different experiences through our lives. And so it's, it's just a, a good exercise to deepen your awareness around race, to, to uh, strengthen that racial literacy, that, that racial consciousness. Um, but I'm gonna read my story and then Dave is gonna share uh, a little bit about his experience as well. I'm gonna, as I read this, I wanna invite you all to um, just, just listen to your body so oftentimes when we talk about race, what can happen is we get stuck in our heads and we over-intellectualize things. We can kind of escape there. But there's a lot of healing and wisdom in our bodies too. So the more you can pay attention to what do you feel, where do you feel it, and know that whatever you feel is okay because God is big enough to hold whatever we feel. There's no right or wrong way to feel. That God is there with you. So as you feel this, there may be some discomfort. There may be some questioning. There may be whatever but know that God is there with you and just, just be present, stay present, stay present. So, let's all take a deep breath together. All right, this is my story of race. First slide, please. When my mother was pregnant with me, the doctors told her it would either be her or me. One of us was not going to make it. The infant mortality rate for black Americans is three times higher than white Americans. I was born too much prematurely by caesarean section and was hospitalized for a week until I was healthy enough to go home. The medical professionals who treated me and my mother were all white. I was born into a system that wasn't designed for me. Next slide. When I was in the first grade, after returning from the bathroom one day, I couldn't find my teachers or my classmates anywhere. I eventually found another teacher in the hallway and they called my mother to come pick me up. I heard my mother having a conversation with the school administrators and I noticed she was upset as she asked them how a white teacher could forget the only black student when leaving for a field trip. This was the first time I remember learning racial differences could mean being treated differently. Another one of my white grade school teachers repeatedly refused to believe me when I, when I told her I was being bullied by white students. She would always tell me, ah, oh, that's nonsense. At the time, I didn't understand why she trusted the other white student and didn't trust me. Growing up, I attended an all black church with all black families aside from one white woman who was married to a black man. And at that church, my culture was affirmed and celebrated through the teachings and the books and the stories and the songs that we sang and the uh, traditional African clothing that we wore. All these things were honored and affirmed and celebrated in this community. As a high school student, I was always a strong writer. <clears throat> but one time I received a low grade uh, in one of my English classes. And I asked the instructor about it. And he said, although I can't prove it, you plagiarized this paper. He said that a student like me couldn't have written this paper. When my parents confronted him about it, his prejudice at the parent-teacher conference, he still refused to change the grade. A girl I dated in high school kept our relationship a secret from her family because her dad, without ever having met me, said he didn't want his daughter spending too much time with someone like me after learning I was black. My entire life, I've gone to schools where I'm either the only one or one of the very few students of color. In my formal education, I've never had a black teacher. All my black teachers and teachers of color have been outside of the formal education system. I also worked at a grocery store where once a white man called me the N-word and refused to go down the checkout lane. There was also a white woman who was scared to go to her car in the parking lot when I was pushing carts and she needed to get an escort to walk her to her car. I've often seen white people, white women in particular, become visibly uncomfortable, body language tensing up or tightly holding their bags to the partner's hands whenever we cross paths. I've literally lost track of the number of times I've been pulled over by police officers. One time when driving home from the campus library, I was followed several blocks and into my driveway by a cop car. Two white officers 
searched my vehicle aggressively and interrogated me about a nearby burglary because they said I fit the profile. Every single time I've been interrogated by police officers, I've been told I fit the profile. As the president of the Black Student Association during undergrad, a white student anonymously posted racial slurs online in response to me promoting our annual soul food celebration. Although I didn't seek any actions, a faculty and mentor of mine was able to identify who the student was and held a meeting with us, where he apologized profusely and said that his behavior was out of character for him. His actions were never thought to reflect his entire race. But oftentimes in class, white students would look to me or the few other black students to speak on behalf of our entire race. During my time studying at Luther Seminary, not only were nearly all the white instructors white, so are most of the scholars and theologians that we study. In the tours that Dave and I do and doing this work in the Lutheran ELCA church, I'm oftentimes the only one or one of very few people in many of these spaces. This is my story of race. Joe, beloved child of God. Thank you. So we invite you to just sit for a moment and feel what you feel, wherever you feel it. You might find yourself wanting to fight. Say, no, I'm one of the good ones. You might find yourself wanting to flight. Get me out of here. Why do these guys come here and try to talk about race in the church? Why are we doing this? You might freeze. This is too, this is too hard. I'm uncomfortable, I don't wanna, don't know what to do or say. You might wanna fall on. Maybe if I'm nice to Joe, I can absolve myself. I can get rid of this discomfort I feel. Maybe he'll comfort me or absolve me. Just notice what you notice in your body about what you wanna, what you wanna do right now. It's just your body trying to protect you. One more deep breath. Breathing the Ruach Elohim, the breath of God, that's one way to sort of keep metabolizing uh, the, this trauma that we carry in our bodies, the stress response that we have. I want to share a little bit more about my story. So um, I was able to go to a church in, in 2015, in um, mid-June of 2015. They invited me to go, to, uh, go down there to Newberry College for a big extended youth gathering. And I got a chance to visit with a couple, a pastor and a youth pastor, and they were just completely uh, despondent and just, uh, just mourning and outraged, and they didn't know, what to do and they said you know we had this kid in our in our church and he was a good kid or you know he was he was part of the community um and we kind of lost track of him after uh, you know confirmation uh and we just don't know what happened we don't know what happened um and and they said you know once he once he started you know kind of left our church he was he was always a kid looking for belonging and he found it and where he found it was in um, on these websites, these white supremacy websites. And he started, the things he was looking for that a healthy culture has, this had for him. It had symbols, it had songs to sing, it had cool hand gestures, it had ways of dress, it had rules of admonishment, it had elders that could mentor him. All, all the things he was looking for, he found on this website. And eventually when he was 21 years old, on June 17th, uh, 2015, some of you might know the story. Uh, he went into, his name was Dylan Roof, he went into Mother Emanuel AME Church um, and he shot nine of God's beloved children in a Bible study when they had welcomed him into the space. And I think for all of us who belong to the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, just like Dylan Roof did, I think uh, he is a haunting figure and we should always look at it because when they first told me the story, I said to myself, yeah, that's, that's horrible. Like, in spite of all that he had experienced in this church, he chose a different path. And I started thinking about it. Was it in spite of what he had experienced? 
And the thing that really haunted me was, was it partially because of the things that he experienced? Or at least the things that he didn't experience, right? Did he ever receive a counter narrative to white supremacy? Did he ever receive, uh, did he ever see any modeling about what uh, gospel-centered anti-racism looked like? Did he ever get that? Or was it, well, we don't touch that, that's a political thing, we don't really talk about that here. This is the church, we don't do that. So that really haunted me, right? Like who baptized him? What did they look like? When he looked out on the st in the stained glass windows, what were the figures that he saw? When he looked around to, um, to his camp counselors, to his Sunday school teachers, who, what did the curriculum writers look like? What did the theologians and the hymn writers look like? And what was their racial imagination? And so I think for those of us in a 98% white ELCA church, we need to ask ourselves, how do we continue to both celebrate these beautiful cultural particularities that we've inherited, but also how do we look beyond those and not conflate our way of doing things uh, with God's way of doing things, to remember that there are many ways to do it. So um, I, I have a song and I don't know, it might have to be like a, a spoken word, unless, unless Erica is like really good, I don't know, we could try it. Um, ben, do you wanna see if, the, if we can get the track and I could, do you, you wanna see if we can get sound? Is it, is it going or not? If not, I'll just do it. I can do a spoken word. Is it in the slideshow? It's, yeah, it's embedded into the slideshow. So are you able to go back? Go back. To the front? Yeah, to the beginning. First slide. I mean, not first, first slide, but first slide of the song. Here you go. All right, see if you can trigger the track. If you can't, it's okay. I'll just do it acapella. All right, I'm not hearing it. That's okay. I'm just gonna do it acapella. <laughs> All right, so we'll do next, and I'll just point to you when it's next. How about that? I can still see the horror and grief the day I met Dylan Roos, pastor, there was pure disbelief. How could this happen? They kept on asking such racist actions with no compassion. To be honest, I had a similar query. How could he inherit a very white supremacist theory? Was it because of his church or in spite of his church? Did he learn whiteness at church or did they fight this at church? Who baptized him? Who sermonized him? Which elders advised him? How many had white skin? What about his hymn writers, curriculum writers? Did they ever swim upstream challenging empires? Or were they afraid that that would fray their braid of people by simply stating that racism is dangerous and evil? Was that too much to ask? Was it such a difficult task? Was there only Swedish saviors shining on that stained glass? 98%, 98%, we need a bigger tent. How do we make a dent? 98%, 98%, does God's love all people based on how we represent? How will we find the Dylan Roos in our church? The Dylan's feeling lonely, the Dylan's on a search. Dylan wanted comfort. Dylan needed freedom. Monoculture models. Dylan didn't need them. Dylan needed stories that were different from his. An anti-racist song to sing unlike the typical kids. If they look at your church, then what will we find? 99% the same while we claim colorblind? What is the type of culture that we're trying to build? If they say we're too divisive, will we stick with it still? Will the fruits from our spirit taste sweet from the tree? Will our mission be abolition to help people get free? Will we proclaim a God of freedom who speaks out against hate? Teaching justice and faith before it's too late. Proclaim courageously, don't hide from the truth, so that one of our youth is not the next Dylan Roof. 98%, 98%, are we worried about justice? Are we worried about the rent? 98%, 98%, Dylan Roof was one of us, so now it's time that we repent. And so we repent now and we offer uh, God to you um, ourselves, we know that if we say we have no uh, racism and sexism, we deceive ourselves and the truth isn't in us, but if we confess it, you are faithful and just. And so we lift to you now um, these uh, children of yours. We lift up, next, next. We lift up to you Sharonda Coleman Singleton. God in your mercy, hear our prayer. Cynthia Hurd, God in your mercy, hear our prayer. Susan Jackson, God in your mercy, hear our prayer. Ethel Lance, 
God in mercy, hear our prayer. Reverend DePayne Middleton, Doctor, God in your mercy, hear our prayer. Tywanda Sanders, God in your mercy, hear our prayer. Reverend Daniel Simmons, God in your mercy, hear our prayer. Myra Thompson, God in your mercy, hear our prayer. Reverend Clementa Pinkney, God in your mercy, hear our prayer. We lift up all of these to you, God. We know that you are God that's faithful and just and you work with us right where we are. So we don't, we don't need to wallow in shame or guilt. We've actually been freed by your grace to go and live out your gospel. So God, give us the courage to respond to the love that you've given us. We may not do it perfectly, but we are called to just move into deeper action, into deeper uh, relationship. So inspire us to do that. And as we move towards your preferred and promised future, remind us of your resurrection. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we have, I think we have a couple minutes for questions, maybe. Um, Erica, I think you can go next. Do we have time? I don't know. We <laughs> do. Not really. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, I didn't look at that. Okay. That's all right. But uh, guess what? Joe and Dave aren't going anywhere. They're going to be here to worship with us and help us lead us in worship for uh, the next service here. So let's get reset. And uh, But before we do that, oh, and then after worship, out there in the hallway, uh, Dave and Joe will be out there at a merch table. Uh, you can check out some of uh, the things that they've produced uh, and created in their lives and uh, share with them, but ask them some questions and engage them in some conversation. But let's show our gratitude for their vulnerability.